This is on? Okay, good. Okay, so today I'm going to switch gears. Um, last time got you sort of a general introduction to dynamics and planetary atmospheres. And we'll make it a bit more specific today to talk about hot Jupiters. I know there's probably a lot of people here interested in this topic. Um, so far, I guess most of the uh, workshop, especially last week, was about more fundamentals, planet formation, things like that. And we haven't had a whole lot of discussion about atmospheres yet. And uh, there's not a lot, been a lot of discussion about the specifics of observations uh, that we have for uh, atmospheres. So I'm going to spend the first part of my talk uh, discussing uh, the observational constraints we have that make uh, the study of the circulation of exoplanets interesting uh, from the point of view of uh, not being uh, wandering off in some unconstrained area. And uh, so after that, then we'll um, start getting into some of the specific uh, dynamical uh, questions that are interesting. And hopefully we'll be able to relate it to what I discussed last time um, so we can kind of compare and contrast um, how the dynamical regime of hot Jupiters is similar to or differs from that of the Earth or of Jupiter. All right, so let's just start with the observations. Um, so there, Spitzer and other platforms have done an excellent job obtaining uh, phase curves, light curves, for uh, now what's a, quite a wide variety of hot Jupiters. Um, this is one of the first ones that was done um, from uh, Spitzer at, at 8 microns and 24 microns. These are half-orbit light curves from um, Heather Knudsen's uh, work um, when she was still a graduate student. So let's look at this uh, plot up here. Um, so this is showing the total light from the, from the system. And of course, hot Jupiters are so close to their stars that you're not separately resolving the, the, the planet from the star. So it's just a combined light. And this is a transiting system. So the planet passes in front of the star once per orbit and passes behind the star uh, once per orbit. And so over here, um, we see this event. This is the, the transit when the planet is crossing in front of the star. And, uh, and so you can see a drop in the relative flux of about 2%. And of course, uh, Jupiter has roughly 10% of the radius of the sun. And so uh, to order of magnitude, you expect that, um, that w during a transit, there's a blockage of about 1% of the light, um, which is relatively easy to detect um, from the Earth, as Dave and others have discussed. Um, and, uh, and so then a half an orbit later, um, we see this event here, where the planet passes um, behind its star, the secondary eclipse. And if the planet were not radiating, um, then you would not see this event. Um, so the step that you see here is the change in flux that happens um, before and after you're seeing the planet plus the star, the combined light. And during this event, the planet is hidden behind the star, and so you're seeing the star alone. And so the amplitude of this step is planet flux. It tells you that you're detecting actual photons from the planet. And, and so the fact that we have this transiting system um, provides a way of detangling which component is the star and which component is the planet, kind of using the time domain, um, even though we can't spatially resolve the two uh, in images. And, um, and then um, to zero with order at least, it's relatively flat in between. Let's zoom in. Um, this is the same data set with an expanded uh, axis here on the Y scale. Um, and the same uh, th thing here, so half orbit from transit to secondary eclipse. So you can't see the bottom of the transit in this particular, you guys probably can't see the edge of this from, is this, is this okay, the blackboard, or is this blocking the? Uh, so, all right, so I'm probably not going to use this, or at least not too much, so. Uh, anybody want to? Yep. Right. Thank you. Oop. I like this light curve, so I want to make sure. All right, yeah, exactly. I want to make sure everybody sees it. <laughs> Dave uh, launched Heather su very successfully on her career, and she's doing great. Um, OK, so, so then in this expanded view, um, here's the secondary eclipse. And there's this dashed line shown um, corresponding to the bottom of the, of the secondary eclipse to just kind of emphasize that this is the star alone, and anything above that is planet flux. And yep? Say that again? With the sinusoidal curve, yeah, where you're pointing now. Yeah, this? Shouldn't that be at the same level as the secondary dip? Right, the right. Good question. Down here? Excellent question. We're going to get to that. OK, so if, there's, uh, if the star is not doing anything funky, if it's constant in time, and if there's no temperature difference between the day and the night side, the light, light curve would be flat. And what you're alluding to is a case where um, you might expect that since these planets are very close in, their day sides are hot, their night sides are cold. And during the transit is the part of the orbit where the night side is aimed toward Earth. 
And so if the night side is cold and not radiating much, um, then just as you mentioned, you would expect that the flux um, during that part of the orbit would be relatively low. If the night side was very cold and really not radiating much at all, then you're right. Then, then the, the phase curve would be down here at this, um, at this solid line, at this uh, dashed line during this part of the orbit. Over here, during this part of the orbit, the day side is aimed toward Earth. And so if that's hotter, then you would expect the flux to be higher here. So potentially you can get this sort of sinusoidal effect. And I'll show, show more light curves in a second, some of which are uh, almost more, much more the way you were um, hypothesizing. Um, okay, and so that's interesting. Another thing that's interesting is that the peak is actually not centered around the secondary eclipse. Um, if it were, if, if the hottest point were at the secondary, uh, I mean, were at the substellar point, then you'd expect that, um, that this sinusoid would be phased so that the peak of it occurred right at secondary eclipse. Um, and so if you think about the geometry of this, imagine doing a little inversion, um, then what this implies is that the hottest region is actually east of the substellar point because it's the regions that are east of the substellar point that are facing toward Earth just before, hours before secondary eclipse. And since, those are, um, and since we see the peak there, that implies the shifted hotspot. Um, this is a similar data set in uh, 24 microns for the same planet. The data's got some scatter, but when you bin it up, um, then you see the same effect. So again, the secondary eclipse in this plot is at a phase of 0.5, and you can see this, sh this sh uh, offset where the peak flux precedes the secondary eclipse. And notice in this plot that the night side flux is about two-thirds of the day side flux. And so that um, gives you a quantitative estimate of the um, day-night temperature difference. We know the radi radius of this planet, so we can convert these measurements into an estimate of the brightness temperature on both the day and the night. For this particular case, the day-side brightness temperature is about 1,200 Kelvin. The night-side brightness temperature is about 1,000 Kelvin. So you have kind of roughly a 20% difference between day and night. This shows light curves for a variety of other objects. Some of these are much more recent. Um, and so in all four of these cases, these are full orbit light curves. And so you can see, for example, here, you've got a secondary eclipse here, another secondary eclipse, the transits here with the bottom kind of off the scale. Um, likewise, two secondary eclipses and a transit that you can't see the bottom of. And, uh, and so in these cases, you can see that um, some differences and some similarities. Um, so, you know, the, the amplitude of the light curve is bigger. Let's look at this one. This is the most extreme case, perhaps. Um, so here's the secondary eclipse, and this is um, for WASP-43b um, from a recent paper by Kevin Stevenson. And this actually is in the uh, WIFC-3 band pass, so at a shorter wavelength from between 1 and 1.7 microns. Uh, the, the transit's off, off here. You can't see the bottom of it. And you can see that in this case, the, the phase curve amplitude is in fact comparable to the secondary eclipse depth, meaning that the night side of this planet is quite dark and is not radiating much flux at all compared to the day side. Um, so these two objects are actually intermediate where they do have some night side flux, but it's um, you know, maybe a third or so of the day side flux as opposed to two thirds in the example I showed on the previous page. This is another example um, where the night side is quite dark. It's a little hard to see, but he put the points that are during secondary eclipse and during transit in kind of a lighter dots here. And so the main part of the light curves in these darker points. But you can see the phase curve amplitude is comparable to the secondary eclipse depth here. Um, well, we don't really have uh, measurements that, that span the entire um, you know, Planck function. But um, yeah, I mean, the, interestingly, well, th this is this is on the on the short wavelength side of the peak. But um, interestingly, the the, I the IRAC one and two band passes, um, which is what these three bands were taken in, um, which are at three point six and four four point five microns, are actually fairly close to the peak of the Planck function. So, from the point of view of putting constraints on kind of the bulk day night actual total flux difference, um, these are as about as good as you could get as far as just a single broad band measurement. But yes, obviously in the future we'd like to actually sample the wavelength dependence of this. Yes. You're talking about this little thing here? Yeah. yeah, perhaps. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, you could maybe, you know, convince yourself that you think you see other features like that. But my guess is that those are probably not too statistically significant. Um, a thing to remember is that with a light curve like this, I mean, you, know, you could imagine the things fluctuating super fast in time, but that's hard to imagine how that would occur, occur uh, you know, from a meteorological point of view. If you imagine the circulation itself is relatively steady, um, and then if you just imagine it, you know, the planet slowly turning, then it's very hard to get short 
time scale features in a light curve like this. If you imagine short wavelength structures on the planet, they still rotate in and they rotate across the disk and they rotate out the other side. And so they'll produce very smeared and broad features in a light curve like this. So most likely, um, any short time features are not associated with the planet's meteorology. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, there's a wide variety of these um, different uh, behaviors. Oh, actually, let me mention one other thing. In most of these cases, in particular these three, you can also see that the peak in the flux precedes the secondary eclipse. Um, it's not quite so strong in this case. In this case, it's closer to zero, but, um, but uh, this um, is similar to the case that I showed you um, in this previous plot here. So, um, so it seems to be a common feature of hot Jupiters that they have a hot spot that shifted to the east. Um, probably three quarters of the planets that we have light curves, light curves for uh, show a clear signature of that. Okay, so um, as far as the amplitude, um, there's a wide range of different amplitudes and it turns out there's a trend emerging in these observations. So these planets span a wide range of effective temperatures and a wide range of incident fluxes that they're receiving from their stars. And if you um, put all this together onto a single plot, so this axis is showing um, just the equilibrium temperature. Uh, we can calculate, it's a theoretical quantity, it's just a measure of the flux the planet receives from its star. Um, it's basically um, you know, uh, assuming that the planet has zero albedo and assuming that the, that the stellar flux is absorbed and then re, re, you know, kind of um, homogenized around all four pi steradians. This would be the effective temperature you would get. And then this axis is the um, fractional difference in brightness temperature um, from the measurements. It's the uh, brightness temperature of the day side minus that of the night side divided by, by that of the day side. Uh, loosely speaking, it's basically um, you know, just this ratio of this, um, you know, the flux on the, uh, on the night side to the secondary eclipse depth, or the flux on the night side to the flux uh, on, the, on the day side. Um, or actually, one minus that. Uh, but uh, converted to brightness temperature units. So, uh, and so what we can see, this, this point here, and some, some of these uh, planets, like this is the, that first planet, 189733b, um, where we have observations at several different wavelengths, and they show um, slightly different values, um, which is indicative of non-gray behavior. For a gray object that's radiating like a black body, um, any given, any single wavelength would give you the same value. So if there's any scatter in this at different wavelengths, it would imply non-gray behavior, and this is showing the average. Um, and so this is for 189, and you can see, as I mentioned, that it's kind of about a, maybe a 25% um, variation in the brightness temperature from day to night. And what's interesting is that the hotter planets seem to have larger fractional um, day-night brightness temperature differences um, in, on average. Um, there's some, you know, this is um, you know, a slight bump in the trend here. Uh, this is uh, an upper uh, limit, or lower limit rather, for uh, WASP-18b. Um, the main planet that bucks the trend, at least potentially, is this one, and this is um, this WASP-43b, the one that I showed you on the previous page that, oops, um, that's got, that really bottoms out here. Uh, this is a bit of a puzzle, um, and uh, so, we, oops, sorry, uh, remains to be, yeah? Uh, you probably well you, you well most of these wavelength most of these uh, points in this plot are um, from the same wavelength but yeah surely you are I mean there's you know you're, there's um, light curves have been obtain, obtained in, in the different um, you know Iraq band passes from three and a half up to um, you know eight microns and then uh, and then at 24 microns as well but um, you know with radio transfer models you can look at what, where you think the photons are coming from and they're typically coming from pressures of kind of um, tens of millibars to 100 millibars or so. The contribution functions, which is the, um, the range of uh, sort of the, the distribution and pressure over which the photons are, are arriving, is, is very, very broad vertically, according to radio transfer models, and, uh, and, and overlapping, so that um, the different band passes are likely um, all sensing similar ranges of pressure, but, but with slightly different weighting, essentially. Um, but still, these wa the, uh, at many wavelengths, um, this does provide information about, for example, how would the day-night temperature difference vary with pressure. And so that's one of the reasons we actually want to get um, light curves at many different wavelengths, not just one wavelength. Okay, so, and this is kind of interesting. As, I, as we kind of alluded to last time in atmospheres, and for example, in the Earth's tropics, there are dynamical mechanisms that are very efficient at regulating the horizontal temperature structure. The Earth's tropics have rather weak um, variations of temperature, uh, so-called weak temperature gradient regime, and that's because there's dynamical mechanisms that, that tend to um, erase the horizontal temperature differences that um, the uh, latent heating or um, radiative heating associated with continent land contrast and so on would try to produce. 
And so it would appear that those sorts of mechanisms um, are perhaps uh, fairly efficient in regulating the temperature structure of the coolest of the hot Jupiters. But this data set would appear to suggest that the hottest of the hot Jupiters, those mechanisms are breaking down. <laughs> And so this is interesting because even though we don't have a lot of data for hot Jupiters, this provides us an opportunity to um, take mechanisms that we understand from the terrestrial uh, you know, dynamic situation or, or the planetary situation in, in our solar system and, and push those to the limit. So we can study these kind of mechanisms on Earth, but we can't study them to the point where they start breaking down because they don't usually break down in Earth's atmosphere, um, whereas they appear to be in this limit here. So that's interesting. Let me just describe some other observations. So um, there's an, an alternate method called eclipse mapping. So when the planet is going um, behind its uh, star here, then uh, when it's in ingress, you can imagine that there you can get kind of, uh, of course, the flux will be dropping over time. And this, you have some one-dimensional information here on how the flux of the planet varies in the direction perpendicular to these little lines. Um, so, and you know, if you were to make the planet hot on this side and cold on that side, or, or instead flip it, cold, you know, uh, cold on this side and hot on that side, that would change the detailed shape of, this, of the ingress part of this plot. And likewise on the other side, but what's interesting on the other side is that the axis is different, right? So here you're sampling in this direction, and assuming you're not passing right behind the equator of the star, over here you're sampling an axis which, if not orthogonal, is at least independent, linearly independent. Um, and, uh, and so you can use this information to actually produce a two-dimensional map. The light curves are only sensing the longitudinal information. Maybe I ought to mention it, in fact, that this plot which accompanied this nature paper, um, the, lot of the longitudinal information in this um, paper results from a rigorous analysis. It's basically an inversion of this data set to get brightness temperature as a function of longitude. The latitudinal information in this particular plot is fictitious. Um, it's just kind of an artist's rendition of how you might expect it to look. Um, so this plot only contains one-dimensional information. Um, however, um, with this eclipse mapping technique, you can get true dimensional information, true two-dimensional information. This is a two-dimensional map um, of the day side of um, HD 189733B obtained from this technique. And, and, and what's interesting is that it reproduces that there is a hot spot on the day side and that the hot spot is shifted to the east by an amount similar to what was obtained in the light curves. And not only that, it shows that the, that the hot spot is near the equator. Now, the, the resolution on this is rather coarse. So when we say it's near the equator, I mean, we're imagining a big feature and we're talking about kind of, you know, within plus or minus 20 degrees or something. But nevertheless, this shows that the, that the um, offset in the light curves, for example, is not due to some super intense hot feature that's right near the pole with nothing happening at the equator. That's ruled out. Yeah? No, I mean, you know, so the planets can have any, you're talking about the inclination of the orbit with respect to line of sight, is that what you mean, kind of? No, no, I know that can be, that's random, but okay. the planet itself perhaps could be spinning on its side. Tidally you're talking about, well, if it's tidally locked, that kind of, I mean, you know, if it's, well, I mean, if it's synchronous, by definition, yeah. synchronous would kind of mean that you don't have that. That's a good question. So we don't, we don't really know what the tidal Q of these planets is, which is sort of a measure of how lossy or dissipative they are inside. Um, but if you use a, um, just an estimate of for the tidal Q of Jupiter, let's say, of order 10 to the 5, um, then you expect that the spin down time, which would be relevant both for synchronization of the, sp of the spin amplitude as well as for of the, the direction of the axis, is a few million years. Um, which is much, much shorter than system ages. So that's why we think that hot Jupiters um, are in that regime. And no, nevertheless, the, the dependence goes as like um, the semi-major axis to like the sixth power. And so uh, once you get out to like 0.2 AU, it's not a few million years, it's like five billion years. And so um, you know, planets outward of about 0.1 AU, all bets are off actually. Um, they, you may have planets outward of 0.1 AU that are you know, partially despun, but not quite synchronized, and then outward of that, maybe you, just, you could have any rotation rate you want, basically. Yeah? How do you get the inclination of the planet with respect to the line of sight from the these models? Uh, the incl you mean like where, what latitude of the stellar disk it crosses? Yeah. Um, so basically, you know the, the period of the orbit, and we know the size of the planet, 
And, uh, and then you can estimate, you know, I mean, if, if you know, the length of the, this transit basically um, provides information on that, given that we know the size of the orbit and how long the orbit takes. So we know the speed of the planet that's moving in its orbit. And so if the, if the thing's crossing the equator, this will be longer than if it's, um, the base of the transit will be longer than if it's crossing a high latitude. And then the shape of the ingress and egress, likewise, you know, the ingress and egress um, presumably are longer um, if you're crossing up here, and they would be shorter if you're crossing at the equator. Isn't that degenerate with the planetary radius? Um, well, the planetary radius is, is um, constrained by the amplitude of this, by the depth of it. And so what I'm talking about here is the length of this thing. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong in any of this, any of the, the observer here. Yeah. OK, good. Yes, the, and, and actually it's a good point that that's often not well known. So the radius of the star is often estimated from evolution models and so on. It might have a 10% error or so, um, I understand. And so um, often um, for these kinds of systems, well, so what you're really constraining here is the ratio from the depth of this. You're constraining the ratio of the radius of the planet to the radius of the star. And, and, and oftentimes that's actually uh, better determined than the actual stellar radius itself. And so the dominant, what that means is that often the dominant error in the actual planetary radius of the type that, that Rem and Tristan were talking about is the estimate of the stellar radius. If there are ingress and egress, would Lynn Darkly bring in a very big error of this kind of error? Of the star, you mean? Or of the. Um, so, um, well, so normally, so and the way this is drawn, this is shown at infrared wavelengths where there isn't much limb dar darkening and the bottom of this thing is flat. Um, if you account for limb darkening at like a visible wavelength, let's say, um, then, then basically what that means is if you're blocking 1% you know, of the disk over here where it's dark, um, that's going to be a shallower transit. And then if you're blocking the center of the disk where it's brighter, you're going to blo be blocking more. And so, and so the limb darkening what has the effect of making the bottom of this thing rounded. And then so in order to fit that, usually um, when folks do analysis of the data sets, they'll have a one or two parameters that, that describe the limb darkening of the star, and they'll fit those as a part of the, the retrieval when they analyze the data. But, but maybe just to be clear, I mean, okay. there's no, no limb darkening for the effect you're talking yes, about. Yes, exactly. Yeah, in the infrared, you don't see the limb darkening. Well, no, no, yeah. when, the, when the planet goes behind the star, the stellar limb darkening is relevant. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. But I mean, for the, for the transit, you're exactly. Yeah, OK. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So the um, yeah. So the, the variations in velocity to eccentricity are going to become a significant fraction. It would change. It would have a significant effect on the length of this. Um, only if the eccentricity is fairly large. And there's several constraints. So one would be RV. So most of the planets I'm talking about are fairly large planets. We can detect them in RV. And, uh, and so um, you know, we can, from the RV, get an estimate of the, of the eccentricity, or, or at least an upper bound on the eccentricity, which for typical hot Jupiters, of course, it's large for further out planets. But for typical hot Jupiters, is about 0.01. But it's not huge. More, more than that, though, um, the, the uh, um, timing of uh, transit relative to secondary eclipse provides a constraint on the, um, on the eccentricity times a geometric factor related to the orientation of the orbit. If, you're not, if, you, if you don't sort of you know, get unlucky where, where the whole ellipse is lined up exactly with Earth, if it's tipped, then, then, yeah, then, then the, the, it won't, the, they won't be centered, you know, that basically, like, the time between transit and secondary eclipse will be different between the secondary eclipse and the next transit. That's right. And what's interesting is, at least for this and, and, and some of the other kind of, quote, benchmark hot Jupiters, where we're getting lots of these observations, um, that, that constraint is quite tight. It's like an order of magnitude tighter than the, than the RV constraint, where you have, like, an upper limit of order of 0 0.001 or something. So I think, and you can actually estimate what the, um, effect would be from that. And my guess is it's fairly negligible to the effect that I'm referring to here. Other, yeah? Uh, the, the error of the measurement of the stars also um, does not only change the, this is not only a problem for the radius of the, of the planet, but also for the inclination because it depends a lot in the Mont Carlo simulation. Okay. On each other. And so you also the okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm not, an, I'm not an observer, so if any people know about these things, then feel free to jump in here. Okay. Any more? Okay, so there's some other interesting work that's been going on. Um, so far, the constraints I've talked about are kind of thermal constraints, but there are um, folks, a couple groups that have been attempting to directly 
uh, measure or at least constrain the winds through using Doppler uh, analysis uh, during planetary transit. Um, and so uh, the first attempt to do this was from Ignaz Snellen et al. in a Nature paper in 2010. So he observed HD 209458b, and they used CRIRES, which is a high resolution spectrometer that has a, a resolving power of, I don't know, 100,000 or 150,000 or something on the Earth. And they looked at a very narrow wave wavelength band in two microns where there's like a ton of, of carbon monoxide lines, which you expect to exist in the planet's atmosphere. Um, at least from, from sort of chemical equilibrium type models. And so, and so their goal was to actually detect the Doppler shift in the, the CO lines during transit. Now, of course, during transit, the planet for the most part is moving perpendicular to the line of sight to Earth because you know, that's the part of the orbit where you're kind of moving sideways. Um, you know, and nevertheless though, you know, during, trans, during the beginning of the transit, you know, the, the orbit has some curvature, so during the beginning of the transit, there's a component moving toward Earth, and then at the end of the transit, there's a component moving away. And, and hot Jupiters are, are orbiting so fast that that's actually significant. That's like plus or minus 15 kilometers a second. And so their primary result was a detection of that effect, sort of essentially confirming the orbital velocities. Um, and the data are such that um, you know, you're um, sort of have few enough photons. You can't see the individual spectral lines. You have to, um, the, the not, each one is not sort of resolved um, as far as the signal to noise. Um, you, you, there's only maybe a signal to noise of, I don't know, 0.2 per spectral line or something. And so they have to use a ton of these lines and then they, they integrate them all up during the transit and they do a cross correlation. Um, you know, so they have a template spectrum where, um, you know, if there's no Doppler shift, you know where all the CO lines should be and you shift your template spectrum back and forth and then you compare it to your noisy data and then you find out, uh, you know, how much do you have to shift it. And when I say shift it back and forth, I mean shifting it in, in what the Doppler shift is, shifting it in the, in the velocity or in the frequency. And then, and then you find out what frequency and therefore what Doppler shift you get the best fit. And so, and so this um, sort of darkish curve here shows, or darkish blob, um, shows that, that peak of the cross correlation um, as a function of orbital phase um, with the center of transit being right here. And so, and this axis is showing the velocity in kilometers a second. And so you can see of order kind of minus 20 to about plus 20 kilometers a second, therefore detecting the orbital motion. Now, we know the velocity of the star relative to Earth, and you know, we know the orbital properties, and so you can subtract that off and then you, you would think that if you subtract that off, you would get zero, but you don't. If you subtract that off, there's actually a residual two kilometer a second blue shift, which is the offset between the bottom of this peak and zero, shifted by two kilometers a second. So what that seems to suggest is that the planet's atmosphere is moving toward Earth at two kilometers a second um, relative to the star. Um, and so that's interesting. It's only a two sigma measurement. It's not super um, you know, robust as far as the signal to noise. Um, but these authors then suggested that that's a signature of winds in the atmosphere. Of course, the whole planet's not racing toward Earth, but you could have air in the upper atmosphere moving toward Earth. And I'll also mention that, that this is during transit. And so if you think about the geometry, um, the starlight's kind of grazing through the planet's atmosphere on a, on a cord that's um, kind of going tangent through the planet's atmosphere. And because there, there's a lot of path length there, um, there's a lot of potential absorption. And so you're sensing a rather high altitude in the planet's atmosphere, much higher altitude than you would um, if you were just looking straight in in a normal direction. Um, and so probably you're sensing pressures of order of a millibar, at the most 10 millibars, maybe even less than a millibar. Depends on the model. There was a question somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th th actually, that was suggested. There's a paper proposing that. So these off these authors suggested that this effect is is uh, due to due to uh, winds. I mean, it's like the last paragraph of their paper. They mostly focus on this thing, but they say, okay, wow, two kilometers a second must be winds, day to night flow or something. And then there's a paper published later that then says, oh, well, maybe it's not winds, maybe it's the eccentricity. But that won't work because of this effect that we were discussing a minute ago, because the timing of the secondary eclipse and the transit are super well known for this planet. And so there's a constraint on, on the, uh, you know, basically E times uh, cosine of pi omega, where that's like the, you know, longitude of the, you know, of the basically the periastron or whatever. And so, and, and in fact, it's not even the eccentricity itself, it's precisely E times cosine of pi omega that matters for the Doppler shift. And so the Doppler shift is constrained to be like, like I don't know, two orders of magnitude less than you'd need to explain this effect or something. Um, yeah, so that doesn't work. Um, okay, so, but this is, this is sort of the average of what, this two kilometers a second is the average of what the planet's doing during, um, you know, uh, sort of over the whole transit. And there's a recent paper that just came out late last year um, by Luden and Wheatley. Um, and, uh, 
And so they, instead of doing a cross-correlation in the IR, they just took HARPS data uh, and looked at the, at the um, you know, this archived HARPS data and looked at the sodium D line in the visible. So it's a huge line. And then, uh, and then what's interesting is that if you imagine that there were to be winds and, and or rotation, so you imagine that the planet, let's say, so imagine the planet's moving across the disk that's so orbiting like this. So the transit direction is like so. And so if the, if the rotation in, um, is in the same direction um, as, the, uh, as the, the planet spin, then, then basically this part would be red shifted and the part over here would be blue shifted. And what's interesting is that during the ingress, you're more sensitive to the red shifted part. During the, um, you know, when you're on transit, in the middle of the transit, you're sensing both the red and the blue shifted part. And then at the end, you're sensing the blue shifted part. You're dominantly sensitive to that. And so there's a hope here of actually teasing apart, not just sort of some mean value, but actually getting independent estimates of what the, of the Doppler shift and the speed uh, on each one of the limbs, the leading limb and the trailing limb. Uh, question? Yeah. How are you sensitive to the different Is it because of the wind the star? No, it's because of the fact that over here, the planet is, uh, you know, basically, um, you know, you're looking at, uh, yeah, well, I guess, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. But, you know, to zero authority, you can just imagine this part not even being blocked by the star at all. Um, and, then, uh, and then this part's, you know, so there's a lot of, lot of stellar light that's coming through this part and, and, and it has a red shift, you know, and then, and then there's not much, you know, of the stellar light going through this blue shifted part because most of the blue shifted part isn't even covering the stellar disk yet. Or isn't, uh, isn't yeah. So does that answer the question? <laughs> okay, feel free. Yeah. I mean, you have the light coming to the, to, from the star to you, and then if the object um, with the spectral lines is going toward you, then that will be a, a blue shift. And if the object is moving away, that would be a red shift. That's right. Well, I mean, that's only true on this limb that's red shifted. That would lead to a red shift, right? And the other limb that's moving toward Earth would receive... Would lead, Yes. Yeah, but think of the light of the star as being continuous. There. So you just pick another wavelength coming from the star. You are trying to think of it in the frame of the of the planet. So you see. Um, yes, because I mean, that's what the light. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you're describing it in the, in the reference frame of the star, where the planet's moving toward the star. But the planet's moving, this limb of the planet's moving away from Earth, and that w that's what matters, because we're observing it. Yeah, but it's still impr impr imprinting a signature, whether, you know, it doesn't matter if it's absorption or emission, right? It's imprinting a signature on the, on the spectrum. Okay, um, yeah, so they, I'm not an expert in that, but they accounted for that. Um, in fact, there's a paper, um, you know, that was published a couple years ago, I forget the first author, McCullough maybe, um, where for this same planet, for 189, this is, this top one's for 209, this one's for 189, 733b. 
And, and they proposed uh, like an eight kilometer a second um, amplitude. I haven't even described the results yet here, but they got a, they got a signature that was way, way bigger. And, and these, these guys um, went through their analysis and said that they did not account for the rossiter mclaughlin effect correctly. And if you do it correctly, then you get something that's more consistent with what they got. Anyway, let me describe the result. So basically, during um, the, so the leading limb, you know, these are kind of uh, you know, basically probability distributions that come from their analysis, um, imply that, that you have a net redshift, as I said. And this gives the scale in, in kilometers a second. So the peak is sort of at a few kilometers a second redshift for this limb. Um, the average, interestingly, is about uh, two or three kilometers a second blue shift. And so that's actually similar to the signal um, seen by Snellen. And so this average is similar to the, th these are kind of apples to apples comparing these two, because Snellen didn't have the resolution um, between the in ingress and the egress, uh, I mean, between the le leading and trailing limb. And then uh, for the trailing limb, we see a blue shift that's of order kind of seven or so kilometers per second. Now the planet itself is, is um, if it's synchronously rotating, then the ro rotational speed of the planet is about two kilometers a second. And so if you're interested in winds, you have to subtract off the rotation. And so um, this suggests winds that are, are weak, but are moving uh, weak, meaning comparable or less than the rotational speed, so like maybe a kilometer a second or something, that are redshifted. And this suggests winds that are maybe three or four kilometers a second blue shifted. So what this is saying is that on the um, limb of the planet that's rotationally, you would expect to be rotationally moving away, the winds are making it move away even faster. And likewise over here, on the part of the planet where the rotation ought to be making it move toward Earth, the winds are making it move toward Earth even faster. So that's a signature of a giant equatorial jet, an eastward equatorial jet, so-called superrotation that we talked about last time. So this is the first observational uh, detection of superrotation on a hot Jupiter. Okay, so some motivating questions. Um, what are the fundamental dynamics of the highly irradiated hot Jupiter regime? Can we explain um, light curves of specific hot Jupiters? Um, what's the mechanism for displacing the hottest region to the east? And also, what's the mechanism for the super rotation that I alluded to um, from these observations? Um, what are the mechanisms for controlling the day-night temperature contrast? And it would be nice to uh, see if we can explain this um, trend of uh, incre where the day-night um, flux contrast increases um, as the planets for hot Jupiters that are hotter and hotter. I don't, won't talk about it today, but just as kind of a placeholder, I'll mention that there's actually quite a lot of data um, putting constraints on clouds and hazes for hot Jupiters. Hazes and clouds, that's a complicated process. The, um, you know, the condensation and the microphysics is complicated. So the amount of data is not uh, enough to really constrain what's going on yet. But nevertheless, there are many observations that show that many hot Jupiters uh, are hazy or cloudy, both through transmission measurements that sort of fill in spectral, uh, you know, where you would expect to see big spectral features where you might not see those, and also just through light curves. Kepler uh, light curves in the visible actually um, provide some hints of cloudiness. Um, so that's maybe for some other talk. And then also, um, you know, given the regimes that we talked about from the point of view of dynamics um, in my last talk, there's the sort of basic question of how the fundamental circulation regime of hot Jupiter relates to that of the Earth uh, or of Jupiter. And of course, that's also linked to um, how the circulation of hot Jupiters would vary with the incident stellar flux and the rotation rate and so on. Um, hot Jupiters are not a monolithic class, and so whenever you look at these diagrams of you know, planet mass or in, uh, versus uh, sort of, uh, some major axis and so on, you, you can see that there's um, planets sort of populating the, the full range of possible some major axes um, and therefore uh, fluxes that the planets receive from their stars. And, uh, and so uh, even though most of the great constraints right now are coming from the very closest end of just a handful of these planets, um, we should remember that there are uh, many orders of magnitude range of stellar flux um, and so on being sampled, and that we would like to understand in general how the circulation varies across different parameters. Just to talk about the dynamical regime of hot Jupiters, I think we know most of this at this point, but just to kind of re recap and kind of summarize. Um, so we expect the circulation is likely going to be driven by this um, global scale heating contrast. For a typical hot Jupiter, you might absorb 10 to the 5 or even 10 to the 6 watts per square meter of stellar heating on the day side and have a comparable amount of infrared cooling to space on the night side. And, uh, and I will mention also that um, the typical evolution models of the sort that have been discussed previously um, predict an intrinsic flux or an internal flux convected through the interior um, that's smaller than this by about four orders of magnitude. Jupiter's flux is of order 10 watts per square meter and uh, through the interior. And so that's four orders of magnitude less than this. And Jupiter's flux, as was discussed yesterday uh, by Rem, would, I mean, the flux of a hot Jupiter would, if anything, be slightly suppressed 
um, ignoring the issue of inflation and, and heating mechanisms. Um, and so we expect a, this multi-order magnitude mismatch where Jupiter itself has a similar amount coming out to what is absorbed, and, and hot Jupiters are not in that regime. They're in a regime where the absorbed starlight dominates. Um, and so even though the interior of the planet is convecting, uh, we might, at zeroth order, expect that the convection is not going to be the dominant effect on, on the circulation we see at the photosphere. Um, also, um, as I alluded to, we had questions on this and discussed this already, and we expect rotation to be synchronous um, with the orbital periods. And since the orbital periods are several days, that implies the, the rotation period is several days. And this implies that the Coriolis forces are important but not dominant, i.e. the Rossby number would be of order unity. And, uh, and in fact, if we, uh, another relevant point is that um, based on you know, the kind of atmospheric structure and evolution models that have been done, um, we expect, as I mentioned, and as was discussed by Tristan and, and Rem, that hot Jupiters will have a thick stratified region, a, a radiative zone, basically, that extends to hundreds if not thousands of bars, depending on the uh, irradiation received by the planet and how old it is. And so, um, and so it's important to emphasize that all of the dynamics that the observations are constraining that we'd be talking about here is not convection. This is not happening in a convection zone. It's happening in a region that's stably stratified. Where, and that what, what I mean by that is that if you were to take an air parcel by itself and push it up, it wants to go back down. And if you push it down, it wants to go back up. So you can imagine the atmosphere like a layer cake. Um, you know, the, it's not convecting and overturning the way you think of in a thunderstorm or in a boiling pot of water or something like that. That does not mean it's static. That does not mean there's no vertical motion. There is vertical motion. Heating and cooling can allow vertical motion. And, uh, and so it's quite a dynamic circulation, but um, just not a convecting one. And then likewise, due to the slow rotation, um, you know, we can sort of think of these as loosely speaking all tropics planets. The strong day-night heating does lead to some differences from the way we usually think about tropical dynamics on the Earth. Um, but nevertheless, many of the same processes that happen in the Earth's tropics do carry over on essentially a global scale to a typical hot Jupiter. Okay, um, so there's now a number of three-dimensional circulation models um, published by a variety of different groups in this field. And this actually started before the observations um, came in. And so what's interesting is that some of these features, including both this equatorial superrotation and the eastward offset of the hotspots, were predicted a number of years before they were actually observed. Um, and so um, in this, uh, this uh, calculation, this is showing the whole planet in one of these early papers um, and the substellar points at the center of the plot. So in this calculation, we're assuming that you have synchronous uh, rotation. So the heating is just on the day side, or the starlight's coming in just on the day side, cooled on the night side. And then you develop this strong eastward jet, and then that eastward jet is causing, um, essentially, a displacement downstream of the, of the thermal field. And so that's what produces this, this offset, um, and uh, sort of qualitatively similar to what you see in these. Yeah. This is an atmospheric GCM. There's no ocean on these planets, so a coupled model, the way you would think of it, is not relevant here. Yeah. Yes. I think the answer is no, but I want to ask anyway. Because the hot spot is shifted, there's some radiation pressure that is being directed, not directly into the sun. I know the planet's huge, so it's unlikely that it could change the orbital parameters, but over billions of years, is it possible that the planet could alter its orbit slightly? You're talking about the other Dan, Dan Fabricki wrote. Yeah, Dan Fabricki wrote a paper on that exact subject. <laughs> I kind of forget the answer, but I think it's basically not that important. Yeah, <laughs> I mean these objects are huge. You know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thrusters. They, they did work it out quantitatively. Well, I think he was using the fact that there was an offset to cause a torque, basically. Yeah. I mean, as my understanding uh, uh, in asteroids is that the Arkovsky effect only becomes quite an important effect once you're fairly smallish. You know, the largest asteroids are not so strongly affected by it. And of course, this is a much more massive planet, uh, despite being very close to a star. Yeah? This? Um, it's close to the Terminator, and something like that occurs in most models. There's one here. You can see a hint of it here um, and here as well. 
So the dynamics of that are not super well understood, but basically, I mean, if you just look at what the models are doing, it's a convergence region. And so, um, you know, air kind of converges and then there's descent and the descent is essentially just pushing the air down. And so when I said that the air was stably stratified before, um, if you think of a convection zone, um, assuming it mixes, then you know, people who are probably familiar with the idea of thinking about a convection zone as an adiabat. So assuming it's irreversible, an adiabat means constant entropy, right? And so if it's stably stratified, that means it's not constant entropy. A stably stratified atmosphere is one where the entropy rises with altitude. And so if you have descent then very rapidly on a time scale that's short compared to what radiation could do, you're going to take the high entropy air from above and shove it down and produce like a local hot region. Um, so that's probably what it is. But the exact, you know, re what controls exactly its amplitude and location, there's not really a theory for that yet. I might mention that when you do simulations like this, it's, it's I mean, you can run these and they're, they're complicated models and there's lots of nonlinearities. And um, just running the model does not tell you the mechanisms. So, you know, just the way you can have data from an atmosphere, um, data is data, whether it's observational or numerical. And by itself, that does not lead to an understanding. So to get an understanding, you have to use a whole sequence of a more idealized models and analytic calculations and so on. I mean, the GCM, the advantage the GCM has over observational data is that, first off, it, it's, um, you know, kind of on a, on a complete perfect grid as opposed to spotty and so on, and, uh, you know, at certain places and times, and that also you can, you know, output it whenever you want and so on. Um, but still, the reason I'm saying this is just to emphasize that, um, you know, it's quite possible, and in fact, is often the case that when you look at outputs like this, you stare at it, and you can see the feature, and you can document what's going on, and you can even make plots of what the velocity is in it, and so on. It still won't necessarily tell you exactly why it's occurring. Um, and that point will come up later. Oh, I want me to say here, so um, a bunch of other groups. That early model that I showed in the previous slide was, um, you know, back in the early days, there was no radiative transfer in the model, and it was just very forced in a very idealized way, kind of putting um, heating on the day side and cooling on the night side. And since then, a bunch of new groups have kind of jumped into the fray. Um, we've updated our models, so now we have realistic radiative transfer, at least as a possible tool we can use, and that's what's shown here. Um, and then um, other groups are using different numerical models that use different uh, you know, numerical methods for solving the equations and different schemes for imposing the day-night heating. And what's interesting is that despite all of these differences in the numerics, um, the qualitative features that different groups are getting are essentially in line with each other. Um, you see this very broad eastward jet, um, you know, so flow from west to east centered at the equator and a uh, hot region on the day side that for typical conditions is shifted to the east. Uh, okay, well, so, so one thing to say is this is a thermal tide, right? The feature that's being stimulated here is the thermal tide, and it could be. Uh, so Tristan and I first suggested in 2002 that, that there could be a torque that was um, associated with the thermal tide, which we, we based kind of on analogy with Venus case, although, uh, you know, I don't know if we want to get into this aside right now, but uh, why don't we save that for the end? Let's, let's yeah, yeah. There's, there's kind of an interesting story there, and if there's time, we can talk about it, but... Um, short answer is folks have looked at that and it might be an effect, but it's not really fully agreed on yet. Yeah. Um, do you or other groups make simulations uh, with depth uh, inside the planet? These are all 3D models. So to what uh, pressure? Usually, um, usually from you know a microbar or a few or a millibar or less at the top to a few hundred bars at the bottom. Yeah, every one of these models is 3D. Okay, so, uh, and mostly from now until the end of the rest of the talk uh, is over, I'm going to talk about dynamical mechanisms. But let me just mention that, um, you know, we do want to be constrained by the observations. I mentioned all these great observations at the beginning. And so um, the observations are now good enough that it's a useful exercise to have GCMs that have sophisticated radio transfer and compare them to, to the data. And so this shows some examples of that. So as I mentioned in our work, we've um, coupled our dynamical core to uh, the model, uh, radio transfer model, the model that Jonathan Fortney and Mark Marley use. So it's, um, you know, uh, you know it's a two-stream model, like I talked about before, but it has a much more sophisticated treatment of the, of the opacities. And uh, maybe we won't get into the details of that, but this is, um, you know, uh, provides a, real, a pretty realistic representation of the heating rate if you know what the composition is. And of course we don't, so you have to make some assumption, you know, maybe solar metallicity ratios, say of O to H, uh, C to H, and so on, or some multiple of that, and so on. Um, so this shows some models. Um, the the uh, synthetic curves on here are um, curves in the four IRAC band passes, at, uh, or actually not, it's three are IRAC and one is MIPS, I guess. These are from Spitzer. 
So basically 3.6 microns, 4.5 microns, 8 microns, and 24 microns. So this 8 and the 24 micron light curves are the ones that I showed earlier um, in my very first slide of the light curves. And those are half orbit light curves, as you can see. Subsequently, um, Heather obtained four orbit light curves in the other two band passes. And, uh, and so this is um, results from our, uh, the synthetic curves are results from our 2009 paper. And this is the same um, model data comparison, but here showing the spectrum, both from the data and the, and the, the models on the day side and then on the night side. Um, and you can see that there's the, the uh, agreement is reasonable. It's not a perfect match by any means, um, but you know the model does produce this um, you know the peak in the in the light curve before secondary eclipse, and uh, and it produces a amplitude of the phase curve that's roughly the same as the observations. Nevertheless, the peak is maybe a bit too um, is a bit too large even in this particular model, and uh, you know some details are not matched perfectly. Um, this is WASP 43B. This is um, from Tiffany Kataria's recent work. Again, um, you know, the light curve shown here, it's the same light curve data that I showed at the beginning and uh, GCM results. Uh, and then day side, comparison of model um, with the observations on the day side. And I might mention also that these, um, when you do one dimensional models, uh, you know, you have to make a choice if you're doing the day side, say to compare to secondary eclipse observations, you have to make a choice about how to parameterize dynamics. So there's, you know, many, many dozens of papers that do this um, where you, you know, assume either that it's, you know, um, you know, you spread the heat, you imagine that the circulation either can or can't spread the heat out over the whole planet or just keep its heat on the day side and so on. And that assumption is relaxed here. So the dynamics is, is uh, occurring naturally and causes whatever, uh, you know, day-night transport of energy that it wants to, and this is the result. Um, this is the same kind of comparison for 209458B. There is a discrepancy on the night side. So these models are over predicting the night side flux. Um, the, the flux in these models, the night side's not as dark as it should be in these models. And there's a couple reasons why that could be. Um, you know, it's uh, probably not the case that the dynamics is fundamentally wrong, but we might have the opacities. Um, we might have made slightly the wrong assumption for the opacities or maybe there's clouds. You could go through a tuning exercise if you want, but that's not really useful in my opinion. The key um, takeaway message from this plot is that um, to zero with order, the models seem to be fitting the data reasonably well, at least the qualitative features, and that suggests to me that the models are in the right parameter regime. So we're not totally fooling ourselves. And that makes it a useful exercise to take these models as a tool and try to use them to now understand what the dynamical mechanisms are, say for the super rotation, for what controls the um, day-night temperature difference and the offset of the hot spot and so on. Okay, so let's talk about the super rotation first. As a, as a theorem in atmospheric dynamics called Hyde's theorem, and we, we talked about this last time actually, um, the super rotating jets, um, and here by super rotation, super rotation means something very specific in atmospheric dynamics. A super rotating jet, wherever it occurs in the atmosphere, is one that must, is defined to have more angular momentum per unit mass than, than the planet would at the equator, at sort of the outermost part of the planet. And so um, if you have air that's moving to the east um, at the equator, then, then obviously that's got you know, even more angular momentum than, than the background planet. And so that is a super rotation. Um, if you have an eastward jet like the eddy-driven jets and the subtropical jets I talked about on Earth, um, even though those are moving eastward, those are not super rotating. And the reason is because they're not at the equator. They're occurring at sort of 30 or 40 degrees latitude. So they're closer to the rotation axis. So even though the air is moving eastward at that latitude, if you were to imagine a thought experiment where you took that air parcel and shoved it to the equator, because you're shoving it away from the rotation axis as you do that, it will slow down and it will become westward. Um, and so uh, there is no super rotation like that normally in the troposphere of the Earth. And so in order to produce such a feature, a local maximum of angular momentum, um, you have to transport angular momentum from regions where it's low, namely outside the jet, into regions where it's high inside the jet. And so that implies an upgradient transport of angular momentum. And that cannot occur from an axisymmetric circulation, such as an angular momentum conserving Hadley cell. Coriolis forces acting by themselves will not do that. Um, you need waves. And before finishing this slide, let me um, move to this and just give you a visual picture um, in general for how an, um, how an eddy-driven jet typically operates. So we talked about the eddy-driven jet last time, and I just sort of hand-waved and talked about how um, baroclinic instabilities transport momentum into that jet. Now let's get a little bit more specific on that. So typically what happens is when you talk about eddies, what you're really talking about is structures that are varying in, in, the, in, the, lat in the longitude direction. Um, and you know, if you have a wave, like a Rossby wave or some other kind of wave, um, doesn't matter what it is for now, but just imagine some variation, whatever it is, um, that causes uh, variations in the wind speed, you know, alternating, say, east-west, east-west, associated with the wave structure. 
Um, and, uh, and so in order to get a momentum flux caused by this, you need to have a correlation between the um, eastward perturbations caused by the wave and the north-south perturbations caused by the wave. And so if you imagine this, for example, um, then uh, so this is a case where, you know, over here in this arrow, the, the perturbation caused by the wave is to the east and, and also to the south. And so if, we, if east is positive and, and north is positive, that means that, that the U prime, which is the eastward component, is positive, but V prime, which is the southward component, is negative. So you have a positive component times a negative component, and so the product is less than zero. Over here in this, in this component, you're going, the component's up, uh, well, sorry, north, and so that's positive, uh, and, and also west, and that's negative. So, so again, you have a positive component times a negative component, and so for this arrow too, even though it's going the other direction, likewise, u prime, v prime is less than zero. And so for all of these structures, and in fact for a wave, typically it's causing oscillation, and so a given, a given fluid parcel is gonna be oscillating back and forth over time, and, and so if you have um, tilts in this way, um, then, then u prime v prime will be less than zero. And I've on purpose not said what the mechanism yet is. I'm just saying suppose you have the tilts um, like this. So, uh, and then down here, suppose you have the opposite tilts where, um, whereby you know, basically when it's eastward, it's northward. So that would be positive in both directions. So the product would be positive. And over here in this guy, this would be both southward and westward. So the product, both are negative and the product is again positive. So again, the, all, they're all positive here. And u prime, v prime, you can think of that as essentially a flux, sort of per unit mass, of angular momentum transported by, by the eddies. And to think about that, um, you can um, just imagine like a dotted line, like imagine a latitude circle here, and, then, and, and just sort of think about to what extent these pa parcels as they oscillate back and forth would or would not transport momentum through that line. Um, so imagine that line here. Now, as far as total mass transport, let me say that as the parcels oscillate, every time a parcel goes outside that line, in fact, we can imagine a whole strip. Let's not just do a line. Let's imagine a strip going from down here to up here. So as this parcel goes up, or to the north rather, it's going out of the strip. Um, but every time that happens, there's some other parcel going into the strip. So there's no net mass transport into the strip necessarily. Um, nevertheless, every time this parcel goes into the strip, he's carrying more than average eastward momentum. Right? And every time a parcel goes out of the strip, he's carrying less than average momentum. And so this guy is going to transport eastward momentum into the flow, into the strip. And this guy is going to transport westward momentum out of the strip, which is exactly the same as transporting eastward momentum into the strip. And so um, as these guys oscillate, they're not transporting any mass, but they're effectively exerting a torque. And, and that's just transporting momentum from regions outside this structure into the center here. And then you can go through the exact same arguments on the other side where, you know, as this guy goes up through some hypothetical line here, you know, he transports eastward momentum um, into this strip. And this guy likewise transports eastward momentum into that strip. So the, way, the particular way I've drawn these is exactly what you would want to take momentum from out here and transport it into the, into the center. And as we all know from Newton's law, if you if you're, you know, um, have angular momentum per time growing here, that's an acceleration, right? Um, so, so again, I haven't said anything about mechanisms yet. All I'm saying is if you can think of a mechanism that makes the tilts this way, if you can generate a mechanism that makes tilts go from northwest to southeast, uh, north of the jet, and southwest to northeast, south of the jet, and, and, and the tilts here I'm referring to are the eddy, the vo these velocity tilts, then that will automatically, whatever the mechanism is, that will automatically transport momentum into this um, region and will generate an eastward jet. And, uh, and so the question would be, would be, what would be, what would be the mechanism for doing this? And there might be different mechanisms in different cases. And so for the eddy-driven jet that we talked about in the Earth's atmosphere, which I talked about and then Yohai talked about in more detail, um, am I doing that time? All right, so good. Um, so for the eddy-driven jet in Earth's atmosphere, it turns out that the baroclinic instabilities that are happening here trigger this class of atmospheric wave called Rossby waves. So Rossby waves, people are familiar with gravity waves or G-modes as you refer to them, which are basically buoyancy um, oscillations. Simplest version is just the surface waves you see on the surface of the ocean. Um, a Rossby wave is, you can think of as more of a vorticity wave. So um, in this case, the oscillations are more dominantly um, north-south or in the horizontal plane, more so than being vertical. And essentially in a Rossby wave, what happens is that as you, and I should say also that the reason the Rossby waves occur is because of the fact that the planet's curved. And so the um, local, the angle between local vertical and the rotation axis varies with latitude. 
And so remember the, this Coriolis parameter, F, that we talked about in my last lecture? So F, is, to rem remind you, is 2 omega times the sine of latitude. So that means its um, sine, of, sine of latitude is 0 at the equator and is a maximum at the poles. And so um, what that means is that the strength of the Coriolis force in the horizontal momentum equation is, is 0 at the equator and has a maximum amplitude at the poles. And the gradient of that is called beta. Um, and so the so-called beta effect refers to any effects that, that, res that, that depend on and result from that gradient in the strength of the Coriolis force. And Rossby waves are the, are the classic phenomenon that results from the beta effect. And so uh, essentially what happens is because of that effect is if you push air north, um, then basically you're changing kind of the local, you know, amp uh, you're going from a region where the planet, you know, the parcel is kind of more parallel to the rotation axis to less parallel to the rotation axis. And so it turns out that, that you know, that's changing basically the, the sort of characteristic uh, strength at which the planet itself is rotating around you. If you're standing at the pole, um, you know, the, the whole, you're essentially, if you just sit there and don't move, you know, meditate right at the very pole itself, and you rotate once per day, right? Um, you know, whereas at the equator, you don't. You get flung around the planet, but you're not spinning, right? So there's actually a, a planetary spin. And so, and it turns out there's a fundamental law in fluid dynamics that talks, that basically says that the sum of that plan background planetary spin plus the local spin of the fluid motion itself is constant. Um, and so what happens is if you move uh, the parcel north, then um, this, you start getting more planetary spin and you have to take that away from the spin of the, of the actual air since the sum is constant. And so essentially the result of that is when you push air north, it spins up in just such a way that it goes back to where it started. And if, you, and if you push it south, it spins up in such a way that the background circulation pushes it back where it started. So it's not actually a, a literal force in the sense of F equals MA, but it's kind of a, a chain of events um, that, that, that allows wave propagation, that leads to a, a wave equation. Um, and there's lots of more details we could talk about, but a key point for Rossby waves is that, um, generally speaking, any time you push contours of whatever north and south, anytime you sort of cause large amplitude north-south motions, it'll automatically cause radiation of Rossby waves. And just the same way that if you take a stratified fluid and shake it up and down, it'll produce gravity waves. So if you slap you know, the surface of water, if you drop a rock in, you'll get a little gravity wave. And just the same way, when you push air north and south, you'll get Rossby waves. And so in the process that does that for the, for the eddy-driven jet in the mid-latitudes is, uh, is baroclinic instability. And then it turns out, I'm not going to explain why, but it just so happens that when the Rossby waves radiate away from that region, they produce phase tilts exactly like this. Um, and that ends up, um, as I described, that will cause a flux of momentum into this region and produce the eddy-driven jet. Now, that mechanism doesn't work so well for the equator because it turns out, and uh, for the equator, I don't really want to get into why because it's sort of subtle, but, um, but basically there's a, a class of wave modes at the equator that are trapped at the equator where they do not propagate in latitude, but they fill what effectively is a waveguide at the equator. And so this, this kind of meridional propagation does not work so well for those. So we need a potentially a different mechanism. Just to uh, maybe make one last point, if you write down an equation for this, um, so here U is the eastward wind and the bar means an east-west or zonal average. So if U bar is the zonal mean wind speed, then the acceleration is written like so. And you remember how I talked about how a a heating or cooling in radiation is the result of a, a divergence of the radiative flux. So cooling is a divergence of the radiative flux. And in very much the same way, an acceleration is a divergence of a momentum flux. It's the same kind of principle. Um, and so, and that's what this is here. So I, mean, I said that U, U prime times V prime is a momentum flux, basically, per unit mass um, due to the eddies. And then the derivative of this in Y with the minus sign, well, the derivative of this in Y is the, is the divergence. And when you add a minus sign, that's the convergence. And so when you converge eddy momentum into this latitude strip, then you get uh, the, the eddy driven jet. There may be drag um, that might balance it in steady state, or it could be that there's other terms. There could be, if you're off the equator, Coriolis terms. If in a 3D atmosphere, you can also have a vertical term, um, you know, where, where you have eddy transport in the vertical direction. You can even have balances between those. So there's lots of complicated possibilities, but the point is that you know, given this kind of structure, you tend to get an eastward jet. Okay, so now let's actually try to isolate the specific mechanism um, in the context of hot Jupiters. So, um, so instead of doing something with realistic ra radio transfer, let's go back to the simplest possible model we can think of. Let's get rid of vertical structure even. Let's think about um, a so-called shallow water model, which is a, a model uh, for a single fluid layer. And we can um, really think about two layers. We can think about um, an active atmosphere. That's one layer with some height h. 
Um, and that's sort of floating or resting on top of uh, a, a, another layer that represents the deep atmosphere and the planetary interior. And we will, for just for simplicity, this is not crucial for the physics, but it keeps it simple um, and, and turns out to not affect things too much. We'll assume the densities in each layer are constant. So we have some density down here and some different density up top. And the density up top is going to be less than that down here. So that, again, is a stably stratified situation. There's no convection. This layer is sort of floating on top of the other one. Now, in general, you could have a two-layer system where you solve for the dynamics in both layers. But here we're going to make it even simpler, and we're going to fix the dynamics in the lower layer. We're going to assume, uh, and then again, this is not crucial to the, to the answer in some way, but it's just the simplest thing to expose the mechanism in the cleanest context. And um, we'll assume that the bottom layer has no uh, horizontal motion. Keep it fixed. And then if you fix the dynamics of the lower layer, then it turns out this two-layer system collapses to um, the equations effectively for just a single layer, for this top layer here. And that's what's written here. Um, so we have an acceleration term, um, you know, a pressure gradient term. In this case, the pressure gradient um, results from variations of this thickness, h. Um, and so you know, because there's topography associated with that, Coriolis term. And then there's, um, if one wants to, um, I can add drag just to parameterize Lorentz forces or, or turbulent mixing or something. So the drag time constant would be a, a free parameter here. And this is parameterized just in a very simple way. This term would have the effect, if there's nothing else going on, it would relax the velocity towards zero, um, would e-fold it towards zero with an e-folding time of tau drag. This term represents uh, mass transport between these layers, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, okay, so this is the continuity equation, mass continuity equation. And so basically this left-hand side, if you set the right-hand side to zero, then this would be, this basically says when you locally change the thickness of the fluid column, the only way to do that if you don't create or destroy mass is to squash fluid into that column or squeeze it out. You know, if the th column's getting thicker, you have to squash mass in. So this is, you know, basically, you know, convergence or divergence. And I should emphasize here, because this is a 2D model, there's no height variable. So this divergence is purely a function of longitude and latitude. And so it's a horizontal divergence. Now, um, if we're thinking about atmospheres, heating, uh, well, so in atmospheres, you know, we imagine that this would be sort of an upper part of the atmosphere, maybe the upper part of the troposphere. This would be the lower part. And, uh, and this would be a surface of constant entropy, an isentrope. And as you may know, um, when you heat fluid, you increase its entropy. Um, when there's thermodynamic heating or cooling, such as radiative heating or cooling. And so, if the coordinate, if the boundary between these surfaces is an isentrope, that means that if you are causing heating on the day side, it's going to take mass from down here and shove it up. Because the entropy of this layer in an atmosphere would be larger than that down there. And so to cause heating, increase the entropy, the air goes up. And on the night side, the reverse would happen. And so we parameterize this in this very, very simple way. So h eq is the radiative equilibrium thickness. So you can just think of that as a radiative equilibrium day-night temperature difference, where it would be really hot or really thick on the day side and cool or thin on the night side. And tau rad is the assumed radiative time constant over which that occurs. So tau drag and tau rad are free parameters of this calculation. Um, OK, and so first we're going to consider linear steady analytic solutions and then consider full nonlinear solutions um, in a step-by-step -step fashion on a sphere. So this is the linear analytic calculation. And so um, not only are we linearizing it, but we're even going to do it in Cartesian geometry. So we're going to throw away the sphere, and, and, but we still have to uh, account for this beta effect that I mentioned, because that's absolutely crucial. And so um, you know, what we do is we basically allow f to vary, the Coriolis parameter to vary linearly with latitude. Um, and that's, this is, in dynamics, a very common assumption to make, and it's called the equatorial beta plane. Just a sec, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we go back? Oh, sure. Uh, yes, so this is, so locally it's incompressible. Um, it's it's um, horizontally compressible, but but you know the the density within each of the individual layers is constant. Um, but that's not crucial to the to the result. If you were to do this, uh, it's possible to redo this, um, assuming kind of ideal gas equation of state, and it would basically add just a factor in front of this this term that doesn't change anything qualitative about the result. Okay, so, um, so we imagine that here's the equator, and this is the day side, and this is the night side, and this is just some function that I've um, specified for analytic tractability, the sinusoidal in this direction, and Gaussian this way. Um, and so what we do then is you know, we, we decide on what tau rad and tau drag are, and, we, and, we, and, then, I know, I know, and then I do an analytic solution of this. And, uh, and this shows the answer. 
And before maybe I describe this, let me just say that this problem is very, very similar to a classic problem in tropical dynamics that was first studied uh, by Matsuno in the 1960s and, uh, and then has been studied in, in detail by uh, Gill in the 80s and then numerous people after that. Um, and it provides lots and lots of insights about processes happening in the tropics on the Earth. And uh, what else do I want to say? So if you, if you solve these, this system without the forcing, if you strip off the forcing, um, but allow the amplitude to be non-zero, then these, these equations, when you're under these assumptions, will lead to, to wave modes. And it will lead to these exact modes I was talking about, equatorially trapped modes. And there's a whole variety of these. So there's um, a Kelvin wave. And a Kelvin wave is a wave that has mostly um, east-west velocities with maxima of the velocity happening right at the equator. Um, and they propagate off to the east. And then there's Rossby waves that are kind of qualitatively analogous to the ones I talked about about five minutes ago, except in this case, they're equatorially trapped. Um, and, and those propagate to the west. And so in a time-dependent problem, you'd see the Kelvin waves going to the east and Rossby waves going to the west. And there's mixed modes and there's small-scale gravity waves and all kinds of stuff. Um, but for this case, we're doing a steady problem where we have both forcing and damping. And so the solution is steady. And so this is what it is. Um, there's equations that describe this. It's all analytic. And it can be interpreted in terms of those wave modes that I described that are well known in the tropical dynamics literature. Question? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So well, in this, in this direction, you can put whatever zonal wave number you'd like. And so here I just assumed a scale. It's set by the, the, the wave number here, because of the linear calculation, is set by what wave number I pick here. And I pick something that's relevant for a day-night scale. And then in this direction, it's set by the deformation radius, exactly, which we talked about briefly at the end of my last talk. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the substellar point is here. And the cross mark is actually the peak of the divergence point. And so um, this is to illustrate that the divergence, so what you're basically seeing here is east-west motion that's kind of diverging from a point close to the substellar point, but not exactly at it. And, uh, and, then, and then there's these kind of more vortical structures over here. And so this divergence is, is classic Kelvin wave behavior. And the fact that it shifted to the east is also classic Kelvin wave behavior. Now, it's not a propagating mode, because this is a problem where you have, steady, you have constant steady forcing and constant damping. But effectively, it's the same dynamical mechanism. So the, the Kelvin wave is essentially trying to propagate to the east, but it's constantly being damped out as it does so. It's constantly being forced, kind of propagating a bit, and then being damped out. And so that's why you have this eastward offset here. And then. A con uh, uh, and on the other hand, you have these structures. These are Rossby waves, and they propagate to the west, and so that's why they're shifted off toward the west. And so if you notice, what, what have we done? We've produced the chevron-type pattern. If you look at the velocities here, um, they're going northwest to uh, nor uh, southwest to northeast, um, south of the equator, and they're going the other way, from northwest to southeast, um, north of the equator. And as I described, that's the exact pattern you need to transport momentum from outside the equator right onto the equator i.e., um, this wave structure, which is just a direct result of the day and night forcing, will converge with angular momentum right onto the equator and will therefore produce a super rotation. And in fact, even though this is a totally linear analytic calculation, um, so we've thrown away the nonlinearities, still we can take our solutions for u prime and for v prime and calculate products, u prime, v prime, and so on. And we can take a divergence of those. In other words, basically um, you know, evaluate the terms in, in this equation here. And, 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 and what that plot, that, that bottom curve is showing is just this term, essentially, for the shallow water system. Um, and, uh, and so you can see that the acceleration is indeed to the east at the equator, and it's to the west off the equator, which kind of makes sense because you're taking the momentum from off the over here and you're sticking it there. Now, an analytic calculation that's linear, I mean, you know, effectively you've assumed that these nonlinear u prime v prime type terms are so small that they're irrelevant. That's why we dropped them. Um, and so um, that's all we get from the linear calculation. But what this says is that if this were a nonlinear calculation, this acceleration would produce a jet here. OK, and so uh, let's um, now, so as I said, it's analytic, but also on Cartesian. So let's try to remove these assumptions in a step-by-step -step fashion. So this, so, so that, now the shallow water equations are, are a classic kind of toy model for, you know, process model in, in GFD. And so there's codes to solve it numerically. And so this shows a solution um, on the full sphere um, for a problem very similar to what I just described. So it's um, basically, um, we took the same problem and this exact same forcing. And the only thing we're really doing is um, now we're solving it on a full sphere instead of on a beta plane to see if that changes the dynamics. 
And this code is nonlinear. It can solve uh, up to very large amplitude, but you can effectively make it linear simply by using extremely tiny amplitudes so that all the, all the nonlinear terms are totally irrelevant. And so that's what this is showing. So this is a, a linear solution on a sphere calculated numerically. Um, and you can see the exact same structure. I didn't put the velocities on here, but um, the contours are just the contours of the height field. And you can see it produces essentially the same qualitative pattern as what you saw in the analytic calculation, despite uh, the spherical geometry. And this shows the equilibrated zonal mean zonal wind. So this is not the acceleration. This is the actual wind in the steady state. And it is indeed eastward at the equator. Now, the numbers are tiny. This is less than a meter a second. And that's just because I, on purpose, made the amplitude really tiny. Um, you know. But if you jack up the amplitude to values that are more appropriate to hot Jupiter values, then you have the same qualitative picture. Um, but now the jet's starting to become fast. This is a kilometer a second now. And, so, um, and yet, you can see the same basic uh, mechanism going on here. So this provides then an explanation for the super rotation that we see in all of these models, these 3D models I showed earlier, as well as in the observations. Well, this was there's one thing, fi final question you could ask, which is, well, this is just a, a one layer shallow water model. How well does it transfer over to 3D? And I think there's more work to be done on this, but um, at least a start of this is just to look at 3D models. Now, when you look at the final equilibrated state of a 3D model, um, you've got the massive jet, and the existence of the jet actually changes the wave modes such that um, it's not super obvious what the relationship is between the full equilibrated state, uh, the modes in the full equilibrated state, and, uh, and the, the original analytic calculation. But what we can do is we can start a 3D model and then um, look at snapshots of it very early in the run. So imagine you know, when you put the model in, when you put sort of forcing relative, relevant for 189733B with radio transfer, it does not take long in the model to get a 500 Kelvin day-night temperature difference and start developing kilometer a second winds. That happens in like a, you know, of order 10 to the 5 seconds or so in the model. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, but it takes longer than that. It takes tens of days at least to start pumping the equatorial jet. And so this shows a snapshot um, after the day night, uh, the forcing has generated a day night temperature difference and generated these standing wave modes, but before those standing wave modes have had time to generate a strong jet. And you can see that this, even though this is a full 3D calculation, this is showing a slice at a particular pressure near the photosphere. It's a full 3D calculation. It's got realistic radiative transfer, but it has the same qualitative behavior. You see divergence at the equator, and, and importantly, the divergence point is east of the substellar point, just as the theory predicted. And then you have these, uh, these sort of gyres here. The detailed shape of these gyres depends a lot on the forcing. Even in the analytic model, I only showed one case, but in our, you, know, you can vary the tau rad and tau drag, and to what extent these, uh, you know, these sort of Rossby wave gyres are, are or are not distinct from this feature it totally depends on the parameters. So, um, you know, this is basically consistent. Question? It's real, but I mean, don't don't forget this is a spin up. This is not this is not steady state. So this feature, if you looked at it even a fraction of a day later, this would be in a different place, and then it's gonna yeah. So there's certain ringing. I mean, essentially what happens is like you know you start forcing, and then and then and then the forcing is so strong that that you know you quickly get you know gravity waves and other waves, and there's sort of a process by which those oscillate around as you go into steady state. I mean, you can of course uh, you know start up the forcing more gradually too, and you get the same same answer. Say again? Animation. You know, if you, if you make an animation of it, um, showing of, of this exact field, the temperature structure, it's not that time variable. You'll see a little fluctuations in the exact amplitude, but you don't see the, um, the kind of structure that, like Yohai showed from the movie of Earth, for example. Um, if you put tracers in, then the tracers do get blown around in a much more complicated way. Probably, uh, my guess is that the absence of time variability, um, well, it's not that it's absent, but the fact that the time variability is maybe weaker than we think of for Earth, um, well, you got to be careful about whether, I mean, this, obviously it's finite resolution, so we're not resolving tiny scales and so on and so forth. But um, even at the large scale, I think there are reasons why it's not so dynamic compared to a, an equivalent large scale model for Earth. Um, for, for one thing, um, you know, it's not so baroclinically unstable. You know, it's all tropics. We don't have this big baroclinic zone producing baroclinic instabilities. And it turns out, actually, that um, a, a super rotating jet is actually quite stable against shear instabilities. So there's a class of shear instabilities that in the dynamics literature are called barotropic instabilities. And if you have a westward jet, a strong westward jet, those can become barotropically unstable, but it's hard for that to happen here. Um, and so, I mean, they may happen, but also you have the, such a strong forcing that if you were to have a growth, um, if you had some instability mode that had a growth time scale of a few Earth days, which is actually similar to the growth time of the baroclinic instabilities on Earth, um, that would actually be damped out because the forcing is so strong that it would just kill off the, 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 the growing wave, basically. Okay. Yes, sure. So in super rotation, we have a local maximal specific angular momentum, like 
Yeah. Yeah, so, the, so, um, so as we talked about in detail before, super rotation does not require a local maximum of angular velocity. Like in the, in the plots that, um, like Yohai in his paper um, showed uh, some movies, uh, some uh, plots of slowly rotating case where if you were to make a plot of, of the zonal wind speed, which is basically what you're talking about, um, versus latitude, on an Earth-like case but slowly rotating, imagine Earth was rotating with a period of 10 days or something, uh, it might look like this. And note, I did not make it negative. Zero is this line here. So this is actually a positive eastward speed at the equator. That's a local minimum with faster. So the, here you'd have your, your subtropical jets going that way to the east. And this, but if you, were to make, if you were to plot that same thing, if you were to take this and just calculate and just plot the angular momentum corresponding to that, it would be a local max. So, but this case, though, um, the, the actual velocity itself is a giant local maximum. I showed a plot of that already. Yeah, that's, a, that's like angular velocity is basically the same thing as the zonal wind speed. Just changing the, you know, I mean, if you basically. No, but it's enough. What? Yeah, so I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it's just a correction factor, a geometric factor. But it has the same theta. Sure, but yeah, I mean, so you'll have a gigantic super rotation at the, at the equator, and then it'll just fall off with latitude. It's nothing different. So you're thinking of diffusion type processes. That's the whole reason I went through this whole exercise about wave, wave transport. So waves, waves are inherently non-local. So they don't, diffusion, diffusion is a process whereby um, the flux of something is proportional to its local gradient, right? So that's when you write a diffusion equation with sort of a fixed law, that's what you're doing, right? You say F equals some constant times a gradient of something, you know? And so, but that's, waves don't transport material. I mean, don't transport momentum that way. It's inherently non-local. Like if you imagine just you know producing a wave somewhere, and if there's no processes, it can transport, it can it can propagate across long distances, perhaps with no no damping even. And then if there's some region far far away that damps it, boom! Suddenly you can deposit, you know, energy and momentum there. Um, so it's very very different than diffusion. And so waves can cause either up gradient or down gradient transport. And uh, to, to get super rotation, you. Well, I've just shown you that it does. I mean, so I've described a mechanism by which that can happen. No, it's not. So, no, so well, well, I'm, I'm, I don't understand the confusion. Tell me again your confusion. Okay, the confusion is from a very, very kind of general understanding of things. So angular velocity and angular momentum transfer plays a role as te temperature and heat transfer. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. They're not, they're not equivalent, no. So temperature, so if you, I mean, you could think about entropy, for example, right? So entropy is a quantity that would be, you know, that's conserved in the absence of, uh, of you know, um, sort of what we call diabatic processes. Like if there's no heating and cooling, if there's no friction and so on, entropy will be conserved. And so process, something like that, or, or, or there's various other uh, conserved quantities. Um, you know, you might imagine some tracer that doesn't undergo chemical reactions that might be conserved following the flow. And typically, not always, but typically those kinds of processes will, will act in a diffusive manner. And temperature is more analogous to that. You have to be careful about the work term vertically in an atmosphere. But if you just think in kind of horizontal terms with a hot region over there and a cold region over there, um, then yes, then, then local motions, if you just kind of start twisting the fluid, you're right. It, will, it may not be exactly diffusive, but it will transport from hot to low. But that's because, you know, basically, it's a case where there's no other terms. If you look at the balance equation for a, tra for a tracer like that, whether it's temperature or some other tracer, um, basically, you just have the mixing caused by that advection, and that's it. And so, but that's not true for, for, for angular momentum or for the zonal velocity. So the zonal velocity, as I mentioned, like, so, so um, you know, there's this, this, this term is a non conserv this term um, is important. Um, and is, uh, implies sort of a, well, right, you know, if you write down the, just the flux, right, so the flux of this um, is, is uh, not something that scales diffusively. And if you look at the angular momentum, uh, it's, not, it's not conserved in the, cons in, the, in the limit where there's no forcing or damping. So it's totally different than, than something like entropy. Yeah, so if these, were, if these were the other way, if these were tilted the other way, um, then, then you would have the reverse process. Then you would transport momentum out of this region. But the, the key point is that the, I mean, the, if, if you do have a jet, that will strongly affect these wave modes, but there's no inherent reason that it has to be diffusive. Yeah. 
Um, so in these models, um, what sets it is a balance actually between, well, it depends where you're talking about, but if you talk about, say, right at the equator, Coriolis force is zero at the equator. Um, and it turns out what sets it, well, if there's strong drag, if you add that, that drag I mentioned, um, you can have a case where, where um, it's balanced by drag, just like in that little equation I wrote. This particular one is a low drag case. And in this particular case, basically the horizontal convergence of momentum is balanced by vertical divergence of momentum. So essentially what's happening is the uh, eddies transport momentum into the um, equatorial region, um, you know, basically uh, in the layer, and then they transport it down into the interior. Almost out of time here. Um, well, uh, maybe I'll just go back to this equatorial jet that was measured by. Oh, yes. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's not an instability. It's uh, it's um, it's it's purely forced. Yeah. So it's because of the fact that we're um, in this linear calculation, or, or also in the GCMs, you're adding this enormous uh, you know height increase over here and a decrease there, or in a 3D context, a huge temp you know forcing a huge temperature gradient. Yeah, definitely. And actually, if you were to um, if you were to do um, a, a simpler experiment, you could imagine. Um, so again, this refers to the height field in the shallow water case. You can imagine not doing a, a, such a steady problem, but instead start with a flat layer and then grow a bump. So you force it in a way that grows a bump and then stop the forcing. So you've kind of produced a bump, and then after that you just let it go and see what happens. So in that case, what will happen is that you'll get a Kelvin wave that looks like this that then shoots off and propagates to the east. And then you'll also get these Rossby wave structures that kind of go and propagate off to the, to the west. And essentially what's happening in this case is that you're frozen at sort of the early time of such a movie um, because of the fact that you're constantly forcing and constantly damping it. Okay, so um, I alluded to the fact that there was a couple kilometers a second um, that was red shifted on the leading limb and a, and a few kilometers a second uh, blue shifted on the trailing limb. And, and um, these kinds of models also produce a feature like that. So this is um, the, basically the uh, plane cutting through the planet. So this would be sort of the limb of the planet as seen during transit. Um, and here's the equatorial jet. This is actually going pretty deep in the fluid. So, so actually the observations are really only sensitive to the outermost layers here. And red is coming towards you. So that, and, and the blue, sorry, red is going away from you. So it's red shifted and blue is uh, coming toward you, so it's blue shifted. So again, this is, this is plotted in such a way as to be during transit. So imagine um, basically you know, the, you know, the planet's moving that way, and so the rotation is this way. And this is just purely winds without the rotation. And so the, the, the red here and the blue there is the signature of the super rotation. Um, and then this is the same thing when you add the, when you add the, uh, the, the background rotation. And so it, it seems to agree with the numbers that, um, that these guys came up with fairly well. Uh, okay, well, I'm pretty much out of time here, but um, let me just maybe motivate in, a, in maybe just a minute or two um, trying to understand the day-night temperature difference. Um, so uh, GCM simulations, as I mentioned, are useful, but by themselves don't imply an understanding. We like to actually have kind of a quanti quantitative understanding of uh, the mechanisms like the jet, but also um, a specific quantitative understanding of, the, of quantities like the day-night temperature difference, um, vertical mixing rates and other aspects. And, uh, and so there's, uh, there's this common sort of um, time scale comparison that's used in the literature where one imagines that air is flowing from day to night. And if the characteristic time scale it takes for the air to cool off um, as the air is crossing the, day side or, um, or crossing the night side and the characteristic time to heat up on the day side, so that's tau rad. So if that is short compared to the time to go from day to night, then you might expect a large temperature difference. On the other hand, oops, on the other hand if, uh, if the radio time is very long, um, you know, if the radio time is 100 times longer than the time for the air to go from day to night, uh, then presumably there will not be much of a day-night temperature difference. So this is used a lot in literature, um, but this, this has several issues. Um, and uh, this includes the fact that, um, first off, there's a whole bunch of time scales in the problem, like the rotation rate and the uh, you know, wave propagation speeds and so on, which are actually not in this time scale comparison. And that's suspicious, because you'd expect that maybe the circulation should depend on those. And also, this is not um, really predictive either because the advection time, which is the time for the flow to go from day to night, essentially is a measure of the circulation, right? That's basically just a, a, a time scale way of writing down the wind speed. And if you already, and, and you can only, so you only know what that time scale is if you already know what the circulation is doing. So you can't even evaluate this time scale comparison unless you already know what the circulation is doing, including the day night temperature difference. And, yeah, but it's not useful. 
Well, I mean, it tells you a priori. Well, for well, for two reasons. First off, if it's if it's uh, you know if you do it after the fact, it's sort of you know just just so stories in a way. It's not predictive, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, exactly. It's not predictive, right? So. Say again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll get some velocity out of the delta t. And then I'll. Uh, which depends on which. I mean, it's coupled, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'll have a v as a function of delta t. Okay. And then I'll plug in, the, uh, in these equations to see what is the. Uh, I, I will calculate the delta t based on how much do you pull over the time that you are moving from the day side to the night side. You're saying to kind of do like an iterative thing, essentially? No. Or Yeah, I mean, so that's that's equivalent, right? So that's that's basically what I'm saying. You need to do the whole thing self consistently. You need to write down an equation for the for the momentum equation for the velocities, the relationship between that and the delta te and the temperature difference. You need to write down another equation for the, that's a second constraint, right? And so that's what I'm describing here—a theory that does that. It's similar to what you guys have, right? But it's, uh, I mean, yes, it has to be done self consistently. By itself, it's not self consistent. Um, okay, so I'm basically out of time, but just the the. The, what we did was to run a, a wide sequence of simulations and attempt to come up with an analytic theory. And I don't have to time to describe that, but we have a paper that was just posted um, a day or so ago. And uh, Tad is the first author of that. So if you're interested in this, I invite you to take a look. Thank you. Um. Physically, how do you imagine the wave breaking actually happens on these hot Jupiters? I'm asking because, so for example, for waves to transport momentum to the equator, you need to break them somewhere in the extratropics, right, and dissipate them. And so my intuition, at least on Earth, is that if you take your Rosby wave, the waves are fairly small compared to the planetary size, and so you can get things like the wave amplitude grows, the contours overturn, you get wave breaking. Yeah. But in the case where of the hot Jupiters, the Rossby waves are actually comparable to the planetary radius. Yeah. And so it's not completely obvious to me how physically that would actually happen. Yeah, it's a good question. So you don't actually need wave breaking. What you really need is damping. And wave breaking is one way of having damping. You can also have just pure radiative damping. And so that's what's going on in analytic calculation. So in analytic calculation, the amplitude is low. There is no breaking but there's still damping of the wave, and that's what allows a transport. And so in the simulations, there could, I mean, on a real hot Jupiter, I mean, there could be breaking of various types of waves, and, uh, and that might even be happening in the simulations, but I think the radiative forcing, at least for a typical regime that's been simulated so far, probably dominates over the breaking. At deeper levels, though, where the radiative damping is not so strong, breaking is probably more important, or could be more important. I wanted to ask about uh, how uh, common is uh, super rotation, and you show that in the in the two D regime. Okay, we we have a mechanism. We can, uh, uh, and in in some models it worked. But then you the, the you show the your three D model. Yeah. Uh, showed actually an eastward and westward. Uh, yeah. Uh, jet at the equator, uh, so. Uh, what, what's happening? Oh, yeah, no, uh, so I tried to explain that, but I may have gone too fast. Um, so I, uh, obviously, w so we're integrating the model from a state of rest. And so when you start integrating at time t equals zero, there's no jet, of course, because you know, we have an initial condition without one. And then uh, what happens is very, very quickly, I mean, the jet requires the waves to get set up. So you have to set the waves up. You have to generate a day-night temperature difference and set the waves up before those waves can start transporting momentum. And so the, 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 the jet will only develop after that's happened. And so we on purpose chose that snapshot to be after you have the waves set up, but before I on purpose chose it. That was literally only one day into the integration. And I on purpose chose it that way to make sure that there was not a jet yet. If I had showed you a plot even 10 or 20 days into the simulation, you would already see a huge jet. Okay. Yeah. But still in the literature, there's been a, a publication of people finding uh, different circulations, uh, right, with the... Um, uh, yes, the eastward and westward. Okay, yeah, so is, yeah, let me elaborate on that. So uh, I didn't really discuss this, but in all, in all these models, the circulation is height dependent. And, uh, and typically what happens is you go from a regime down deep where you have this jet, 
and then um, and then it starts to become height variable, meaning it starts to you know the amplitude of it as a function of longitude starts to be, become larger. The very fractional variation of it uh, with with longitude becomes larger as you go up, and then finally once you get high enough, you do get to a point where um, it's essentially only on one sort of you know one branch of the planet. Maybe two thirds of the range of longitudes will have an eastward jet, and the other third will have a westward jet. So it's basically in, in that very high altitude range, it's basically a day night flow that's just modified by the rotation. And of course, in communication with the jet below it, yeah. And so that that typically occurs at at, at least in these models, that occurs at pressures that are lower than the typical infrared photosphere. But some of the transit observations, transit spectroscopy, are probably sampling that region. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, let's thank Adam again. So, Rain Blanche is not where it was yesterday, but the other.